This is just the beginning. Welcome to Reimagining Recycling Virtual Event. I'm Allison Snyder, a managing editor at Axios, and I'm coming to you from my home in Washington, D.C. Thank you to the American Chemistry Council for sponsoring today's event, and welcome to our audiences on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and on Axios.com. Please follow along using the hashtag Axios Events and at Axios on Twitter. Over the next 45 minutes, we're going to unpack how policymakers and the private sector are partnering to try to eliminate plastic waste in the environment. Our first guest, founder and CEO of the Recycling Partnership, Keith Harrison, joins us from Walpole, New Hampshire. Hi, Keith. Hi. Thanks so much for doing this. Really glad to be here today. Um, I was hoping we could start by talking a little bit about the scope of the plastic waste problem and if there's one statistic that sort of motivates your work. Sure. Um, before I was in recycling, I worked with sea turtles and turtles on a bigger level. And at that point, um, plastics in the ocean was just really getting on the radar of being a concern. Fast forward 25 years later, and we understand that it is a very serious concern. And if we don't do something by 2050, there will be more plastics in the ocean than fish. That's my one number one motivator. So there are several responsible parties here, and your work focuses on companies. How should they be held accountable for society's plastic use? Right. The Recycling Partnership was formed to be an action agent to overhaul the U.S. recycling system. We're about seven years old. And so what does that mean? Uh, it means that the, the public has a real passion for recycling because there's an emotional connection to our stuff. We really don't like throwing something away. It feels like we need to do something good with it. That's where recycling comes in, but recycling is not a perfect system. It doesn't serve all materials. It doesn't reach 100%. It needs an overhaul. And so the Recycling Partnership was formed to be this bridge between communities who run recycling programs and companies who create the stuff uh, that could go either go into the landfill or into a recycling system. And we felt like there needed to be a better connection between them so that we could build a better system that helps communities and citizens, people recycle more, that helps companies design better products. And that really pulls back and, and asks the question around, um, you know, really, what do, why do we have all this stuff in the first place? Very often I get asked about questions of what's more recyclable, one type of material or another. We, we encourage people to step back and really think about it instead and let's talk about the design and delivery of goods that people need, and then get to that concept of how do we get the products, the resources, the tools we need, um, and, and pull back from this conversation of, you know, should I really be talking about glass versus plastic or, or paper? Mm -hmm. Can you give an example of, um, I guess, a, a uh, sorry, can you give an example of a, a maybe a success case and another where an effort maybe has come up short and sort of what could be learned from those those cases? Sure. So I think that when we talk about recycling, um, we're a national nonprofit and we give grants to local governments all across this country. Uh, if we want to do a pop quiz, I have one for you. How many recycling programs are there in the U.S.? You ready? There's about 9,000 recycling programs. That means 9,000 local decision makers who are all responsible for running their recycling program. What do we tell people to put into the bin? How do we market that? How do we uh, make sure that it turns into a new product someday? That's a lot of decision makers. Um, what we're interested in is really trying to harmonize the U.S. effort so that um, one community can be consistent. I think everybody's had the experience of, I can recycle this at home, but I can't recycle this at work. Why is that? So we're really working to bring that harmonization to the system. That will be an example of what good looks like. We're not quite there yet, but we are seeing some successes on the packaging design side. Um, I, for instance, we have a coalition called the Polypropylene Recycling Coalition. Uh, polypropylene are things like your yogurt cups. That's an exercise or that's a material that's had a whole industry effort behind it to really make something that didn't used to be very recyclable more so. And we're really working hard to build uh, better end markets, uh, better sortation and better community programs so that there's not a question of can I recycle this here, but an understanding that that the system has changed to make sure that it is truly recyclable. 
You hinted at this earlier, but what are the limitations of recycling as a solution? So recycling is one important part of what we call the circular economy. And let's describe that a little bit. Right now, we live in a linear economy, and that means something is made, and when it's done, it's reached its end of its life. It's, um, it's either landfilled, or if it fits into a recycling bracket, and the person puts it in the right bin, it's recycled. It's a make-to-waste uh, linear system. What we're interested in is something much more, uh, think about a tree. When a tree loses its leaves, those leaves become uh, an ecosystem and the nutrients for the tree. That cycle continues. If we model our economy around that circular system, where the products from one thing becomes a feedstock and fuel for another, we start to see opportunities um, to make sure that we're again thinking about the design and delivery goods of goods, not just what is something packaged in. Um, so this opportunity to advance a circular economy is very interesting to us. And we're seeing a lot of momentum from companies. We're seeing a lot of passion from people. And uh, there's a huge opportunity right now uh, in 2021 to see an even stronger commitment from Congress. So what's the economic case for shifting to a circular economy? And what's the price tag? The price tag, uh, if we're going to level up the U.S. recycling system alone, that's a multi-billion dollar challenge. What does that mean? That means that every person can recycle at home, um, that even in multifamily homes, which is often trickier to recycle than single family homes, we have universal access to recycling. That means that community recycling programs have all the trucks they need, the carts they need, um, and that MRFs, which are the material recovery facilities, the plants that separate recycling, that those have all the equipment they need to be at advanced for new types of materials coming in, not just historically recyclable one. So we see that in a multi-billion dollar price tag, and we start to ask the question of whose responsibility is that? Um, we draw that, that uh, pie of responsibility, and we look towards companies who are producing materials to step up and more than ever before, we see a commitment from them. Um, we see local governments playing their part. We see the public playing their part. And we're looking to see more, um, more engagement from Congress with new legislation uh, that we'll propose in 21 that will really help uh, fund that entire system and advance us towards a circular economy. I think you know what the public wants is to take away this question. They don't want to have to think about recycling all the time. They want to be able to do it without recycling. That's our, or they want to be able to recycle without having to think about it. That's our goal. And what are you looking for from the next administration to address this issue? We recently received, uh, released a paper about what policy could achieve in this country. And what does policy mean? Policy means um, holding accountable the companies that are producing materials to be part of the solution. And I've been in recycling for more than 20 years. And I have to say, next year could be the year that we've all been waiting for. It could be very different than what's happened in the past. We see the public aligned with concern around plastics waste. We see companies aligned with saying, you know what? We have serious goals to make sure that we're not part of the waste problem. And that means we're going to have to put our money where our mouth is. And they're willing to do that. Uh, we see, um, we see the, the need for a better system and it, with policy to pull that together, to, to hold those brands and companies available or accountable and put that together with community work. That could be the big game changer. So we're really excited about what next year could bring. It's a very bipartisan issue and we want to help push that through. One last question. What's one product you look at um, and hope it can be better produced or recycled in your lifetime? Um, we have a series of work streams around plastics. We are working on polypropylene, uh, tubes like all your beauty products, um, films and flexibles like your pouches and wraps over things. That's where we need the most work and that's where we need companies to join us in leaning in and really building not just a design solution, but a better system to make sure that all of those are recycled more. Thank you, Keith, for joining Axios. I really appreciate it. Next up is Axios CEO Jim Vandehei with a view from the top segment. Uh, thank you very much, Allison. It is now my pleasure uh, to bring you a conversation with Chris John, who is the president and CEO of the American Chemistry Council. Uh, we're going to have an electric conversation about plastic. How are you doing, Chris? I'm well. How are you doing, Jim? I'm doing great. Uh, thank you for thank you for doing this and helping make this conversation possible. 
Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this debate about plastic, right? There's there, there's many dimensions to it. A lot of environmentalists get very concerned about uh, about sort of the renewable nature of it. Uh, and you have this is some pretty complex views on this. And I'd love to hear them in terms of like, how do you eliminate plastic waste from the environment when you need uh, so much plastics to do different aspects of, 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 of society. Yeah, so uh, look, in terms of the benefits of plastic waste, the first thing I'd point to is the situation that we find ourselves in right now in response to the COVID pandemic. So our industry never shut down and uh, they're producing literally life-saving products or products that keep you and I safe. Um, inputs like surface cleaners, hand sanitizers, wipes and bleach, or uh, many of our members are manufacturing either inputs for personal protective equipment or um, actually making the equipment themselves in terms of face, mesh, uh, shield, gowns, diagnostic equipment, all kinds of medical equipment, plastic tubing for all kinds of medical applications. So that does just kind of scratching the surface in terms of what our members are doing. But in terms of plastic waste as an issue and plastic waste in the environment, our view is that plastic should never, ever be in the environment, period, and a story. And this is an important priority for ACC and its members. And so that's why we developed a uh, plan to solve the problem that we call a roadmap to reuse, which is a strategy framework to bring key stakeholders together to ensure more, more plastic is recycled because it's gonna require more than just our industry alone to solve this problem. But our members feel so strongly about this issue that they've set a goal to reuse, recycle, or recover all plastic packaging in the United States by the year 2040. And when you think about uh, a sort of the calls to, uh, like, can you just recycle your way out of uh, out of this uh, problem with, with, with how much plastic is out there? Like, what are the alternatives? Like, when you when the industry thinks about, like, safer, cleaner forms of plastic, more reusable forms of plastic. Like, Where are we in the science of that? Where are we in the technology of that? So, you know, Jim, we do support using materials more efficiently. We do support uh, utilizing reusable packaging where it's feasible, but advanced recycling is a key part of the puzzle here in fixing these issues. And from our perspective, we need to fundamentally alter how we think about waste and plastic waste in particular. We need to look at plastic as a valuable resource uh, in the same way that we do as aluminum or paper. Well, we can take those uh, products and break them back down into their basic building blocks and then reuse them for new products. Well, the same is true for plastic. And so we do have some innovative game-changing technology that makes that possible. But in order to be successful at this, we got to modernize recycling we have to redesign packaging. We have to use these advanced technologies that I'm talking about to capture and reuse plastics. The good news is that we're well on our way to doing this. We've got uh, 64 projects announced in this space already, already over an investment of $5 billion in this game-changing technology, which has the ability to divert over 9 billion pounds of waste out of landfills. And just to give you kind of two real world examples, uh, what our member companies are doing in this space. Shell, for example, is committed to using 1 million metric tons of post-use plastics per year as a feedstock for its chemical plants in the next five years. CPCAM, another one of our members, is running a commercial scale project in Texas that takes facility, um, takes recycled plastic waste at its facility and turns it into new plastic that will go into products that you and I use every day. So. We're actually well on our way to solving this problem. When you talk about smart recycling, you seem to be talking about it from a company perspective. Like what could I as an individual at home do, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna use plastic bottles today. I see a FedEx truck pulling up now. I'm sure I'll get something that's uh, wrapped in some form of, of plastic. Uh, you know, the masks, uh, some of that we're using, especially the shields uh, made of plastic. Like what can the consumer do? Or is this much more on the technology side and what the companies need to do? Uh, everybody has their role to play. So as a consumer, you just need to make sure that you uh, put your recyclable materials into the bin and then you get it out to the curb so the system can then work the process. Now, you know, you and I in Northern Virginia have a different system than other folks in Oklahoma may. And that's part of the challenge that we have in terms of solving this problem. 
And that's why we're looking for bipartisan congressional action going forward to create a national recycling strategy um, for this because there are so many differences all across the country that it's really hard for consumers uh, like you and I to understand what our role to play is. And if we can nationalize and standardize that, it's gonna make it a lot easier for everybody to understand their particular role to play. And then that's where the technology can come in and help us solve this problem going forward. You talked about a congressional strategy. How much would mandates be a part of that? Like what can the federal government do to mandate changed behavior among companies in terms of the ingredients that they're using or the, the processes that they use for what you call smart recycling? Is there a role for mandates? Do we need tighter regulation? Well, we do need, we are looking for bipartisan congressional action. Um, interestingly enough, there are, already is bipartisan support for these innovative technologies that are, are being deployed and support for this idea of revolutionizing uh, the plastic waste stream. So we've already seen Congress pass a bill called the Save Our Seas Act. They did that in the last Congress. The Save Our Seas 2.0 Act is about to be poised in Congress right now. Um, and we've even seen advanced recycling bills pass in nine different states. The Democratic governor, for example, of Pennsylvania just signed one into law last week. Um, but that's not enough. And what we do need going forward are some common sense policy solutions. So that's national recycling standards across communities. So we do need that. We need to grow and incentivize advanced recycling technologies. And we need standards for more recycled content in packaging and products. Taking those three actions would go a long way to helping solve this problem. Chris, uh, thank you uh, very much for this uh, co conversation. Thank you for making the broader uh, conversation uh, possible today. And lots of people interested in, in industry, interested uh, in the environment. And this is an, a very interesting collision of, uh, of those topics. So we really appreciate uh, your time and your support of the program. Thank you, Jim, appreciate it. Uh, and back to you, Allison. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Our next guest is the Managing Director of Closed Loop Partners, Bridget Croak. She joins us from Burlington, Vermont. Hi, Bridget. Hi, how are you? Good, thanks. Thanks for doing this today. Absolutely. Um, so Closed Loop Partners is an investment firm that's focused on companies and projects related to the circular economy. And I'm hoping we can start by talking a little bit about how can companies be incentivized to implement new recycling or circular economy strategies? Yeah, so the circular economy is something that is meant to be a business solution. So this is not a philanthropic endeavor that companies need to do because it's good for the world. But ultimately, if we can optimize the material coming into the supply chain, and then at the end of use, when the consumer uses that and puts it in a container, so hopefully that gets recycled and becomes the feedstock for future packaging and products, which ultimately, if we can scale that kind of system, a circular supply chain, it should be more cost effective for everybody involved because folks are spending a lot of money, companies, municipalities, et cetera, throwing valuable material in the garbage today. Can you give us a sense of how big the circular economy is today and sort of what the, the trends are? Yeah, so we are seeing, and, and there's been several studies showing that there is a multi-trillion dollar opportunity if we can really optimize for a circular economy. So today, uh, the traditional system is we extract materials out of the ground. It gets manufactured into something, sold, used, and thrown away. And there's value in those inputs. And at the end of the day, we're spending billions of dollars throwing another multi-billions of dollars of valuable material in, in the trash. And so we have seen major companies from Unilever, Nestle, Walmart, and others make significant commitments to use recycled content to reduce their waste of plastics and make sure their uh, supply chain is as circular as possible. So these commitments add up to many billions of dollars that could shift from a linear system into a circular system. So this is a question from the audience that I wanted to fold in here about sort of what's the role of the financial system and specifically investors in addressing the plastic crisis and um, how can government encourage those private sector actors? Great question. So our goal at Closed Loop Partners is to create investments that prove the business model of a circular economy. And so we have investors, including 
large consumer product companies and retailers and more traditional banks and institutional investors that have invested in our funds because we are investing in uh, circular economy companies, projects, et cetera. And so the, when, a, when a company, when a large company like a Unilever or a Walmart or someone else commits to using recycled content or doing refill models, that proves, that sends a market signal that shows there's a lot of op- a lot of business opportunity in those emerging models, and that these companies are moving away from using kind of extractive virgin uh, plastics and materials. So mm-hmm. ultimately, in order to scale the infrastructure needed, uh, recycling infrastructure, manufacturing infrastructure, et cetera, we need significant investment in order to build these circular systems and infrastructure. And so when a large consumer product company or retailer sends that market signal, it shows investors that they should be in, that there's an opportunity to invest in these emerging systems. And so we need billions of dollars of investment from the financial community in order to scale these new systems. And so as we've seen our corporate investors both invest and make commitments to use recycled content, that brings in the investment community because now they see opportunities. And that's how we get to kind of a small emerging system into scaled circular supply chains. So I want to shift and talk a little bit about some of the brands and companies. Um, How have they pivoted or not during the pandemic to reduce plastic waste? I mean, how is the pandemic affecting um, these goals? Yeah, it's really interesting. I don't think we knew what to expect when when the pandemic, I mean, nobody did when the pandemic started on any front. But in terms of continuing to prioritize circular economy, sustainability, and recycling goals, would that still be a major priority for these companies at a point when they have to think about this very immediate and global issue? But some of the things that we identified is when supply chains started to break down in the spring and pe- you know there was a shortage of supply of toilet paper and other items, a lot of that may, um, a lot of those products are made from recycled content. And so when we had a lack of supply of material, investing in getting recycled content back into those products and packaging actually helps shore up those supply chains. So while we saw challenges um, in the recycling industry, no doubt, and in manufacturing, these companies really have not slowed down in their circular economy goals or investing in them. We've, we've raised hundreds of millions of dollars in investments from, and again, this is not philanthropic dollars, it's investment dollars from large consumer product companies and retailers and traditional investors this year during the pandemic you know, showing that they're still prioritizing this because they see this as the future of transparent, secure supply chains. Um, a related question, I guess, is uh, what, this is another audience question, what's your advice to brands and companies who want to speak about their environmental impact but avoid greenwashing? How do they, how should they go about that? Yeah, I, you know, I think when we talk to a company, you know, there are there are companies that are really thinking about how to integrate sustainability and circularity into the core of their business and everything that they do. And then there are companies that have kind of philanthropic endeavors around the edges that don't relate directly back to the core of their business. I really encourage when a company is thinking about their impact on the world that they don't think about doing something outside of their business, but that they really focus on their core business model and how that can be both economically and and environmentally sustainable and also have a positive social impact. And those things don't need to be separate. So I'd really think about like their supply chain, um, the product that they're offering to their customers and how that... And, and focusing on the issues that are really core to how their business is making an impact in the world. Um, I was hoping we could talk a little bit about automation and how it factors into the circular economy, both today and in the future. So things like recycling robots, um, drones, how do they sort of play yeah. into, into what you're trying to do? Yeah, recycling is actually, it's not a high margin industry. And so innovation can be slow to have uptake in this industry. And so you'll see this stuff elsewhere before it comes into the recycling industry. We invested in a company called Amp Robotics, which is one of the kind of early AI and um, and robotics companies that actually helps uh, sort material in a recycling facility in a more efficient way and actually learn the materials going through this so that hopefully in a cost-effective way, we can better sort 
more materials and make sure that more materials are recyclable. Um, I also anticipate that we'll see more automation in different kinds of refill models um, when people can refill their packaging and also when at the curbside of getting uh, materials collected. So we really have a better understanding of what's going through the recycling stream and, and data drives efficiencies and also reduces cost. And so these robotics um, uh, and AI companies are really starting to scale. And we saw that a lot this year. And I think it's a trend we're seeing, continuing to see with COVID. The automation also creates more safety in the facilities for really, in some other cases, risky jobs. Are there, um, we've focused on recycling, but are there other opportunities for technologies in the circular economy, technologies like um, robotics and uh, drones and things like that? Absolutely. So another uh, company that we invested in is a company called um, Algramo, which is a smart packaging refill model where the packaging actually has a chip embedded to, into it so it can actually track how much or how little you're refilling. So you can get you can refill your packaging uh, without having to pay for the price of, of the packaging every single time. And so that packaging acts as your wallet and is actually tracking um, your purchases and, and helps you in a more cost-effective, kind of more convenient way, refill. So we're definitely seeing this technology across a range of solutions. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us today, Bridget. Yeah, no, we're thrilled to be here. I really appreciate it. Up next is uh, my colleague, Dan Primack. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Allison. My name is Dan Primack. I am business editor here at Axios, and we're very pleased to bring in our next guest, Representative Haley Stevens from the 11th District in Michigan, but today joining us from Washington, D.C. Welcome, Representative Stevens. Thank you so much, Dan. It's great to be with all of you here today. So, Congresswoman, you're known as kind of one of the leading voices in Congress when it comes to plastics recycling. So, so let's start with this. Why? Why this issue for you? Well, look, we have a plastics problem. We know that. Um, we are recycling, in some instances, less than 10% of the plastics that we should be. Our municipalities are shouldered with the burden. So that means that the cost comes back to the consumer, back to the taxpayer, back to small towns across America where we've got 10,000, over 10,000 different standards. And we need to streamline the process and we need to get in front of it because we've got an incredible infrastructure and supply chain opportunity with how we approach plastics recycling in particular in the United States of America. Is this, I'm wondering, is this something when you were campaigning for Congress originally that, that, that came up on the trail or, or how did this issue come to your attention? It was certainly something that I knew I was going to work on when I got to Congress. And uh, with some of the people who uh, helped elect me out of my district, it was something I told them I was going to go and, and work on. And over the first year in Congress, um, through my position on the Science Committee, I was able to hold the first uh, hearing in almost 10 years on recycling technology. And what was fascinating out of that, Dan, is we had private industry, we had municipal leaders, and we had researchers all saying the same thing about the needs for the need for standards. And then from there, I formed the Plastic Solutions Task Force, bipartisan task force, the way in which we need to do business in the United States of America when we're looking at large challenges, big opportunities, bring all the stakeholders to the table, bring the companies to the table. I've got bottle manufacturers, I've got nonprofits who are a part of this task force, I've got Republicans and Democrats, because we know we want to get in front of this opportunity that we have, which is to create and enhance a more robust recycling infrastructure in the United States of America that doesn't leave behind what we see when we were overly reliant on China. This is a jobs opportunity for us. How, from your perspective, how, you know, there, there's the inputs and the outputs here, right? The input is lots of plastic that, that we consume as Americans, and then the output is either throwing that away or recycling it. How much of this is a supply side problem on, on the inputs versus the output from your perspective? Sure. So what the manufacturers will tell you is that they want to see these goods reused, that they want to see us adopt what's called the circular economy uh, and an approach to not just throwing away single-use plastic. So 
We focus a lot on bottles, uh, certainly with beverages. Everyone's looked at the major uptick uh, in in uh, in bottle usage. Water bottles is a great example, but we can look at shampoo bottles. We can look at plastic cutlery, and we can also recognize that plastic is frankly a part of our everyday life. You drive in a car, you know, you eat food, you're you're touching some form of plastic. How do we recapture that? Is the question, and so. What we need and what I'm focused on, Dan, is the R&D opportunities, the the sorting, uh, what happens. It, it, look, we've got responsibilities as consumers. You can be impeccable with how you recycle. And we want everyone to uh, take recycling very seriously. But we also need to look at the back end infrastructure, what's happening at the municipal level, where certain companies are coming in. I've got one here in Livonia, Michigan, for instance, that can take all the trash that that you you dump out, they, they're not even focused on, on sorting, but they can turn it into new chemicals. They can turn it into diesel. That's a reuse that's got a lot of potential. It's got investors coming in. And frankly, in Michigan, what I see is our, we're known for our supply chain opportunities. So I think this is a major boon for us in our economy. And again, to lessen our reliance on foreign markets. You mentioned that manufacturers care about this. What on the plastics manufacturers, why? And particularly in light of the fact that we have such relatively low oil prices right now, obviously petroleum ultimately makes plastic. It's the main input. Why do manufacturers care? Isn't it cheaper for them right now to just make them new? Sure. So what I've seen from our manufacturers is, look, they're in, they're in business like everybody else. Uh, they, they recognize that they've got, uh, you know, consumers and demand and all this great stuff going. Uh, but their partnership and there's, there's stewardship, not only from the federal government, from, but from the World Wildlife Foundation, the, the plastics that are being dumped into our ocean. That's not necessarily coming from the United States of America, but it's something that I, I think belies good business, right? So we want to see uh, businesses adopt measures that are going to be more sustainable on the back end. And also, they recognize that the products that they are producing have value, have value. You know, <laughs> it, it, it's not necessarily that it has to just be a, a, a single use throwaway. I Another way in which I've tapped into this, Dan, is through remanufacturing principles. This is not plastics, but this is different types of steel or other goods that go into manufacturing that our manufacturers, right, if you're an automotive, they'll recapture this. They'll reuse, they remanufacture. This is, these are great principles. And so what we're seeing from uh, companies, you know, from, from the, the big bottle manufacturers, on the back end to the the actual beverage companies, they want to be in front of this. They want to be uh, showing the leadership. And I I welcome it. I'm bringing everybody to the table because the minute you start pointing fingers, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're not necessarily leading yourself down the path to success. We've got to do collaboration. We're in the 21st century here. We've got to bring all the partners to the table and it, within our built environment and design new strategies, which is why I've got a bill on this, by the way, Dan. Well, I've got a bill on this to get this done. So let me ask about that bill. Tell me the one or two most important things that bill, which is a bipartisan bill, would do were to become law. Sure. So one, it's working with the Environmental Protection Agency to advance a national recycling strategy. This is a whole of government holistic approach for the United States of America. It would give some direction and synthesize the need for standards that we're just hearing from uh, from uh, industry to researchers to municipalities. This is this comes down to even better labeling. Uh, secondly an investment strategy for the research and development. I, I believe through these supply chain opportunities, we can advance and enhance technologies in our recycling base to, to foster ways in which we are going to better recycle plastic and potentially other goods as well. Can I ask, from your perspective, is it primarily a technology problem or a logistics problem right now, the, the, la the relative lack of plastics recycling? We, we've got a technology problem. The logistics are there. You've got a lot of households that have fully embraced recycling. You've got municipalities who are prepared for it. Where they're stopped is one on costs. Costs are still very real. 
Uh, and we always see this with new technologies. They're very expensive on the front end, right? So how do you get these uh, technologies adopted at the local level? And this is where we're bringing in nonprofits, other grant opportunities. Obviously, if it were not for the pandemic, we probably would have seen some more things piloted here in Michigan this year. I had some folks ready to go with this. Things obviously changed for the time being, but we're what's still the, what's pushing on that. Guys, what's the most interesting pilot that that either has started or that will start at some point from your perspective? So one of the pilot opportunities that uh, we're seeing here at the, the local level is, is just really to adopt um, the, the tools to recycle at the local level. You have to understand, Dan, up until 2018, our municipalities were shipping over to China if you were small government or even if you were a large government. And so what they're looking at now is what were the, what supplies chain opportunities did they have in China that we can bring back here to the United States? And so if this is buying certain types of goods, uh, different types of machinery, uh, that's something that we were looking at and or instruction, just instruction and education to the consumer who's asking, and I hear this all the time, we need the information. We need the information on how better to recycle. So those were a couple of the pilots that we were looking at. Representative Haley Stevens of Michigan, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be with you. And thank all of you for joining us today and to the American Chemistry Council for making this event possible. Please sure to check back for up-to-date information, news, all that stuff all day at Axios.com or on the Axios app. And get my newsletter, the Axios Pro Rata newsletter, and all of our newsletters at signup.axios.com. And while you're there, check out, we are expanding into local news in cities like Denver and Des Moines, Iowa, and Tampa St. Pete. Check it out if you're in one of those cities, or if you've got a friend or family member in one of those cities. And uh, again, thank you very much, and we will see you at axios.com. <laughs>